Claire, thank you so much for coming on the show. I was so excited when, um, I'm going to be honest, when your PR people came to me and were like, would you consider having Claire on the show? Because at the time I hadn't seen Operation Mincemeat, but I had friends who were, excuse my French, losing their shit over Operation (laughs) Mincemeat. Um, It's a good show. It is a good show. It is more than a good show. Um, And I, one of my best friends, in fact, I think was on her like third trip to see it. You know, I knew the phenomenon that it was, but I hadn't had a chance to experience it. I since have... And it is such a special, brilliant thing. Let's launch in with, this is a very special episode because you are not going to be talking about a speech today. You are going to be talking about a song. And that song is going to be from Operation Mincemeat. So (laughs) why don't we start, Claire, with you just telling us a little bit about the show for people who may have not seen it and then tell us what the song is and a brief intro to why you love it so much. So um, the show is Operation Mincemeat. It's a new musical comedy, um, been running since 2019. Uh, The actual show is about a 1943 uh, deception plan concocted by the the British intelligence um, to fool the Nazi party into thinking that the Allied forces were going to invade Sardinia instead of Sicily. Um, And so they, they did this by very madly coming up with a plan to dress a corpse up as a British uh, British pilot, plant um, important documentation, in quotation marks, on him um, detailing the attack on Sardinia, um, planting him in the Spanish waters in the hope that um, Spain would then pass him over to Hitler and his advisers, um, and he would move his troops accordingly out of Sardinia into Sicily. Uh, oh, sorry, so Sicily into uh, Sardinia. So, yeah, um, absolutely mad scheme, which actually did happen and actually did work and helped us win the war. Mad. So, yeah, and I mean, we kind of, um, or, or Spitlip, have created this musical comedy which uh, kind of tell the story through a really creative way. There's only five people in the cast. We each play a load of different characters. We each have one main character or maybe two main characters. And then we kind of just quickly change from character to character to character to tell this mad, mad, mad story um, in, um, in a very fun way. I mean, such a good intro. And I would say, first of all, like you say, the, the origin of the story is mad. And when I first... Uh, when I saw it recently, I went with my husband and there was a wonderful moment where he had no idea what the show was we were going to see. And in the first five minutes, there was a reference to the idea, you know, and he leant over to me to go, oh, that's actually, uh, that was a real thing. It actually happened. They dressed up a court. And I had to be like, babe, that's the show. Like, pipe down. I, I understand. Like, don't worry. But also, I think you've you've hit on something there, which I loved so much about it. And I think speaks to what I love about my favourite experiences at the theatre anyway, which is your cast of five. And I think Mm. so many amazing things are made. One of my favourite phrases when it comes to theatre is, I'm going to get it wrong now, necessity is the mother of invention. Is that it? Necessity is the mother of invention. But I think it's that idea of, I imagine, and you can speak to this more maybe in a moment, but I imagine that Spitlip developed this for five people initially because maybe that was the number of people in their troupe. That was a number that you could manage paying people maybe a little bit of profits from doing a fringe show that would you know it's all these things that mean it originally you go this has to be a small cast and actually what that leads to is the most inventive beautiful like fun joyous impressive theater you know true essence of theater show that you can have and I think it's a great shame sometimes when we go and see these big budget things in the West End where money's been thrown at it and it's a cast of like 25 people and actually you slightly lose the essence of what's really magical about theatre. So I guess like what's what is the experience like for you of being in this five-hander where you're playing a million parts and you don't get a chance to breathe? (laughs) Well yeah it's funny you should say that because I think uh, from from what I know that, that is the reason why it is a five-hander is because, and that's the reason why, so the fun thing about the show as well is um, at 
uh, this current stage, the writers are in it and, and have been since it was first made, or three of the writers anyway. There's four writers in whole. Spitlip is made up of four people, um, three of which are in the cast. Um, and the reason they were put in the cast is because of budget. Like, it was the cheapest way mm -hmm. for the show to run. Um, yeah. And they just needed another two people in order to complete basically the amount of characters that they needed to portray. Um, and that's the reason why it is five people. But yeah, and because of that, it has created this fantastic show, which, I mean, not only is the script well written and, and kind of like the music is fantastic, but yeah, it is so different because of the fact that it is about quick changes and it's all very slick. And you, you like people have said like <laughs> that they think that there's more people on stage than there actually is at points. But this is why theatre is so great. Like, I love it. It's so exciting. And the troupe, you are all so... You are so talented, but so nimble. Um, but I think it does just make for something really, really thrilling. So, okay, so tell us about your favourite song. So the song is called Useful. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lovely song between um, one of the main characters I play called Jean Leslie, who is um, a young MI5 secretary who is um, who basically wants to change the world. She, she's, she's a feminist. She's taking advantage of this chance that she can finally climb the career ladder that was, you know, mm -hmm. until now dominated by men. And then on the other hand, you've got um, Jack's character, who plays Hester, Hester Legat, um, who is um, head of the MI5 secretarial pool. Um, and she's completely different in her way of thinking. She follows the rules. She very much kind of plays the game and believes in the long game rather than kind of like everything happening in an instant. And this duet is about kind of like how uh, over the course of this operation, they have discovered that they've learned lessons from each other. And it is a really like, it's basically the kind of marriage of their friendship. What made you first really fall in love with it? Did you sort of see the show, I imagine, before you joined the troupe? Or did you join so early that the show was still being made like at what point did you come into contact with this song i mean it, it's the latter as in like i've been really privileged on this whole this whole course this whole crazy course of this show being developed because the show has been developed over a very long period of time um which is again can i something to say like it, something that hardly ever happens in musicals usually musicals are given a whole load of money they're done like a couple of private workshops and they're shoved on a big stage and a big mm. and a big spectacle while this has been literally kind of polished over i mean four and a half years now well, we've done sort of like, this is our fifth run, sixth run, fifth run, I think. And slowly capacities, audience capacity has grown bigger. But I yeah. joined in the second iteration of this um, of this musical. Um, and Useful didn't actually come around until the third iteration. What Useful now kind of does was done in a, in a kind of reprise of another song that happens earlier on called All the Ladies, which is sort of like Jean's main song. Um, and it was completely different. I couldn't even tell you how it went. It didn't land as well. And... Mm. Um, Useful came almost as a kind of result of lockdown. So Tash, who plays Montague in the show, she was, I think she was the main She's one behind so it. Brilliant. She wrote the lyrics. She's so good, mm. isn't she? Mm. She wrote the lyrics for it. And the whole thing came out of just her wanting to feel useful at that time. I, I remember getting a voice note from Spitlet being like, I think we've done it. I think we've nailed the song. I think that's really interesting as well, what you were talking about, the changes that the show has gone through, because it reminded me a little bit of... Um, the play that goes wrong not in um format necessary or structure but in terms of its story and its and the show's life yeah. because the play that goes wrong gang were at drama school at the same time as me so i can remember oh. them we were in different years but i can remember the the early devising of this clown show and I thought that was amazing when I then saw it on the west end because i was thinking well there are things you are doing here on the west end that you couldn't possibly have done at Trafalgar downstairs or you couldn't possibly yeah. have done wherever you were before that and the same for Operation Mincemeat when I saw it and it's like a beautiful two and a half hour long musical I was like <laughs> well what was what wasn't in there at the beginning because it all feels oh. so necessary <laughs> the set <laughs> the money <laughs> <laughs> well so I heard a little rumour can you confirm this I heard a little rumour that um, essentially back to my necessity is the mother <laughs> of invention the show that the brilliant show that it is was made on very little budget, but then you were obviously given somewhat more of a West End budget. And where does that West End budget go? Most of it might have gone towards the end of the show. <laughs> There's a bit of like a kind of like a joke, like the last joke of the whole kind of show is the fact that a lot of the budget might have got spent on the last 10 minutes of the show. <laughs> Hilarious. It is like this last joke. So 
to what extent do you still get very moved singing this song now? Because, of course, it's so easy to go on autopilot when you've been doing a show for a long time. Do you have certain shows or certain moments where you're like, God, that really hit again? I, I will say, like, this is the song that always hits. And it's the song that I, I'd like to hopefully think that I don't think I've ever performed exactly the same every time I've done it in God knows how long I've, I've been singing it. Yeah. Just because there's so much to it that I can relate to in different points of my life. Mm -hmm. The premise is that not all heroes get medals and that everyone is is useful. Uh, and being useful is sometimes merit within itself. Mm. And everyone behind a plan or behind um, a venture is just as important as the person, um, the figurehead at the front. And I think we've all gone through moments in our lives where we aren't like that person taking the bow or we aren't the person getting the the acclaim um, where but we've contributed the same, if not more. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And, and that is very, an <laughs> I was about to say, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of people in different careers being like, yeah, I hear you. But yeah, 100 percent as an actor, you know, we and even as creatives within our industry, I think we're all horribly aware of how little um plaudits are given to the casting director or the stage manager yeah. or the you know like all those other people that ultimately made the thing yeah be as brilliant as it was also swings swings oh so talk more about because of course yes that's a musical theater thing that I oh yes yeah, so, about. so yeah, talk about swings yeah well swings it, it kind of like so they understudy the understudies as in terms of like and sometimes they have they understudy the leads as well so they they're waiting off stage ready to go on at a pin drop I've never done a swing, but I, I kind of like, I don't think I could. Like, I don't know if my brain would retain that amount of information. It, it's it's a massive kind of like undertaking, especially like a musical theatre, because a lot of them, like a lot of tracks are dancing tracks as well that swings kind of cover. So the fact is like, you, you're not only knowing one kind of like where you're supposed to go or one routine, you, you know, all these things. And then, as I said, like they, they understudy as well. So mm. on top of that, like they might be a cover for a lead as well. So they, they know all the dialogue they know all of that i i, I don't even yeah i don't know how their Hats brains off. do it uh, yeah also like asm tracks as well because you get people who do asm stroke kind of like understudying um like on tours on smaller tours as well so yes who explain both. that to the listener so asm meaning assistant stage manager. Uh, assistant stage manager so they yeah. kind of like they help out with the stage management kind of role side of it as well so again mm. they've got that to learn and that to undertake um mm. and yet they're the person that might go on and understudy one of the roles as well so they've again so much information to retain yeah and so much pressure um what are your favorite musicals oh do you know what like isn't it funny i so quick like i mm -hmm. was in musical theater for a long time from when i was like 21 up to i'd probably say the age of like 28 and then i fell out of love with it and actually i left and i became a publicist for a little bit um how interesting. So, Talk in, like, about that more quickly. So what, what, how come? All the obvious reasons? Yeah, the obvious reasons, I think, as in like the reasons that we, we really don't speak about as in, you know, in like kind of like you, you don't get the creativity because of the fact that you're, you, if you go into a musical that's been running for a long time, you're just kind of expected to do what the people before you have done. So you're mm. very limited in terms of your creativity. Um, also, there's just the fact that the auditioning, the kind of like the unemployment side of it, um, it, it doesn't get any easier, especially as you get older. You kind of like realise the stakes when you walk into an audition room with who's in front of you. And then it gets harder because the pressure amounts. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think I kind of just lost the love of it over a while. Like it wasn't worth the money that I was getting paid for the sort of trouble that I was putting myself through anxiety wise. Yes. So I left, did something completely else for a bit and have come back and have kind of like my journey has been very much like I want to do new stuff I want to still remain creative or at least like I'd love to do like a big commercial thing and then do two or three tiny like tiny things that nobody's ever heard of yeah yeah but because of that I lost all my old musical theatre loves I think so I think all the musicals that I did used to love when I was younger I think now I'm kind of like they're slightly I don't really jaded know. Yeah, not slightly jaded, but I think that was a completely old me. So I don't really like, now I'm sort of like, there is like a musical I love that it's sort of like nobody would ever have heard of, but I'm listening to the album over and over again called In the Green by Grace McLean, which was this like really random new musical over in America that only did like a very short run, I think, of like two months, but I'm absolutely obsessed with it. So, I mean, that's what I mean. Like, I think the, the, the stuff that I love at the moment, nobody would have ever have heard of. <laughs> that's amazing though. That's so good. And I think that's a really interesting point you just said there about the creativity that I hadn't thought about that actually within musical theatre so much stuff is repeated like theatre for some reason doesn't stand that test of time like for yeah. a show to run for 
six months to a year is insane. Like if it's a normal play. I mean, you think about things like the play that goes wrong, the mouse trap, right? Which I can't remember how many years we're up to now, but it's very rare for there to be normal plays that run that length of time. Whereas yeah. musicals are so, you know, like Les Mis is just always going to be there and Phantom of the Opera is always going to be there and the Book of Mormon's always going to be there. So I guess so much... I think acting limitations mm. as well. Like, I wonder if, for example, like, I wonder if the mouth trap, if, if the same is in terms of, like, you have to play yeah. it for the like, person before you, if there is, there is more stretch in, in kind of, like, That's the character interesting. Yes, play. I don't know. I wonder if they probably, I, I, I reckon there's a bit more room in terms of, I, I guess, musicals as well. You, you kind of, timing-wise, you're stuck with the certain way that you have to deliver lines. For example, if you're delivering them over a song, they have to be delivered in a certain rhythm. Yes. So, structure-wise, you have, there are limitations to the character yeah. and the way you can play it. Yeah. Well, at least with the play, I I wonder if I, I bet there's more room. Um, we should return to the song. Yes. <laughs> are there any? Because also, I'm aware that at the end of the episode, uh, listeners are going to be able to hear Yay. the official cast recording of you doing Gosh, the song, that's which mad, is isn't really it? cool. <laughs> um, so before they hear it, or so that they can look forward to it, are there any particular lines in it or any particular melodies or moments or harmonies, because you said that it's a duet, isn't it, um, that you particularly love? Um, this is such a random thing to say, but like at the beginning of the, of the song, yeah. she kind of says, I imagine the medals they give me when this was all through. And it kind of like just details her dreams, which are ridiculous because she kind of like envisions herself being meddled by Winston Churchill for this mission. <laughs> but, you know, like nobody's ever really going to know that she was a part of. But in my head, I kind of like envisage like us, it sounds so dumb, but us making the show and kind of like like the dreams of us all at the beginning of being like, this show is going to be really big and we're going to win loads of medals for it and it's going to be great. And then you have. Yeah, no, but as in like, yeah, I mean, God, like the dreams came true, but as in kind of like just yeah. a little us like back years ago is sort of like, especially like Spitlip, just the kind of like being like, we're just going to write this show for the fun of it and see what happens. And, you know, we'd love all these things to happen, but really deep down, we don't really think they will. Also at the end when um, there's another line where basically the song culminates in this sort of like lovely harmonizer duet between um, Jean and Hester. Yeah. Um and um, she goes, um, I think that when people meet in the middle of a war, it seems like it means something more. And again, like I, I sing to Jack on that bit, who plays Hester and, and Jack and I have been kind of like the two actors on the sort of like sidelines of this show. It's obviously like you've got Spitlet, the three yeah. kind of who wrote it. And we're all really we're all really good friends. And we get on so well. But Jack and I have like been the ones where we start, just like sit down and while they go and write the show and we're just being like, we'll go and eat crisps by the side. Yeah. Of the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Jack I mean? so, like, is <laughs> Oh, he's amazing. phenomenal phenomenal but yeah. yeah that line is kind of like I specifically think about me and Jack and I'm kind of like that's our that's our friendship um final question mm -hmm. I'm aware that I've possibly done this in this interview um but do you feel boxed as a musical theatre performer do you struggle now to be seen as anything other than a musical theatre performer or do you feel that there is some liberty to pursue other avenues Do you know, when I was younger and it was again a reason why again I fell out of it I think maybe times have slightly changed um mm -hmm. when I was younger I felt very very boxed in um and I kind of felt that this is all I'm being seen for and all I'm expected to do with musicals which isn't necessarily a bad thing I love musicals um since I've come back maybe because I'm older so I'm getting seen for a different kind of age like age range mm -hmm. um yes yeah, suddenly I've we get seen like, for like mum and I'm I like, know. oh, am I mum now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I see. It's happened. <laughs> there are my screen kids. Um, but yeah, I think now I'm older, like, or, or maybe just changed agents or whatever. Um, mm. I've actually ended up, I, I've been seen for like probably as many plays as I have been musicals. Great. I think the only thing that stifles me now is my own, um, my own kind of like self-esteem being like, oh, well, I trained in musical theatre. I can't do that. But yeah, uh, not not so much now, but definitely when I first graduated, yes. You must find that like an, a traditional theatre audition in comparison to a musical theatre one it's feels so like a nice walk in the park. Oh, oh my so God. Because nice I was about to say, I've had the flip reverse, right? I'm not a musical <laughs> theatre actress. When I was a kid, that's what I wanted to be. I was like, I want to be in musicals. Um, <laughs> but I'm just not good enough at any of the skills. But I have been seen for musicals just a couple of times in my career. And one was um, 
Once. Do you remember the musical Once? Oh, God, Once? what a beautiful musical. So somehow I got seen, and I think that's because they wanted people who could sing and play instruments. I thought you played the piano. Yes, yeah, so I play the piano and the violin, and I'm not oh, gosh, great perfect. at the violin. I don't love it. And the first time I was seen for it, I was seen for, I think, one of the supporting leads, and it was hands down the worst audition of my life I walked out and I sobbed because I remember I'd cycled there maybe with my violin on my back and I don't love playing the violin anyway and I've almost had to say to my agent since so many auditions used to come in where it was like and it's great if the person can play the violin I'm like I think we need to behave like actually I can't because I don't like it but anyway I cycled there and my hands were freezing and I remember going into the audition I had to sing act a scene and play the violin and it was these two people in there and one was the MD was the musical director and he was a very stern I can't remember his name but he was not a very nice chappy he was very very stern it was clearly the last audition before lunchtime he just wanted to have his lunch and yeah. he was very sort of okay come on let's start with the violin and I learned a big lesson in that audition about taking control of your own time um and again if I were all if I'd been older um older and wiser I might have had the bravery to be like Actually, I'd like to not start with the violin. I've just cycled here and my hands are freezing and I'll be bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so if you'd like to see bad violin, we could start with the violin. But if you'd like to see good violin, then no. <laughs> um, but I didn't. So I tried to play it and I just couldn't play the song. I mean, he wanted me to play it twice the speed that I'd learned it at anyway. But it was so bad. And I remember bumbling through it at the end. He just went, OK, I'll give you another go. And I did it again just as badly. Um, And I just remember walking out and, yeah, bursting into tears. Hilariously, I was then called in to audition for the lead on the piano when it went to Broadway. And I was like, why is this musical that I'm clearly so bad for haunting me like a nightmare? Like, it's both a dream job and a nightmare job at the same time. Oh, no, mate, I've, I've, I've 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 had those auditions as well, as in, like, not necessarily once, but I've had those ones where I'm like, I'd love to do this, it's a dream, but... I'm never going to get it. I'm not your girl. going to go really bad. Yeah, I'm (laughs) not your girl. Um, But I definitely learned also, I think, in that audition, the amount they want to see in a musical theatre audition. Like, again, the skills. You must have, when you started doing normal theatre auditions, just been like, this is a walk in the park. Don't you want to see more? (laughs) Yeah, the the difference is as well, I don't know if you like, but again, with musical theatre theatre, because they don't have, they have to see so much in a a limited amount of time. You don't get the kind of like the one-on-one so tell me Chit about chat. the script. What do you think about this yeah. character? How are like, you doing? What have you actually, been up to recently? <laughs> yeah. Like, is in like, yeah. Or just kind of like, what's your opinion on yeah. how this character should be played? Actually kind of like, again, it's it's the creativity of it because it, they're limited for time. Like, I mean, bless them because they've got to get through a song and then they've got to get through another mm. song and like three scenes or whatever. But it is the difference on kind of like, number one, you feel more settled. Number two, you feel more valued as a person when somebody sits you down and literally is like, tell me about yourself and what you could contribute to this play as a person yeah. as well as an actor like it, it 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 just is a different situation i love i love straight play auditions i love them i absolutely love them. i think i thrive in them because of it yeah i'm like give me more yeah <laughs> but yes seriously like um it is it does feel a lot not that's not to say like all musical theater auditions are horrendous because they're definitely not and there's some lovely lovely people behind those panels it's just a different setup and like you say yeah the type for time yeah um, exactly Amazing. Claire, this has been so fabulous. Thank you you for for telling me me all about Operation Mincemeat. Um, (laughs) And we are now going to play your favourite song, Useful, from Operation Mincemeat. I imagined the medals they'd give me when this was all through. You imagined the... Medals, I know. Right. And then Winston goes... Winston Churchill. We'd be lost without you. Right, and where is this? The palace. Oh, of course. And I bow and salute. The king knows we're the reason we've won. Oh, the king's there, is he? And there's so many medals. And the crowds, they'd assemble and demand to hear just what we've done. And Mr Churchill says? He says, yes, it's all true. Though you'd never believe it, they did what they could do. And though you'd never see it, they worked and they prayed. And it wasn't in vain, they knew could be strength and that strength could be pain they forced enemy forces to fly they banished the planes from the sky and they did something useful well i look forward to the wireless event what about you what about me what's the dream scenario miss leslie 
How about a statue? Oh, for goodness sake. Here lies Hester Leggett. Oh, good, I'm dead. Oh, Jesus, what is wrong with me? Perhaps just a small plaque. Go on. Something tasteful and small. Of course. Nothing over the top. People don't stand and stop. Cause just one look and their tears start to fall. Oh, Lord. I can see it with flowers, pride of place in a garden. A garden? Or a grand royal park. Ah, oh, thank you. And it's silver. Go. Gold and it shines. Or dazzles. Boldly and they'll see you did more than your part. For Hester who served her nation. Yes. And they'll say it's all true Though you'd never believe it She did what she could do And though you'd never see it She worked and she prayed And it wasn't in vain She knew pain could be strength And that strength could be pain She forced enemy forces to fly She banished the planes from the sky And she did something useful Yes, we've done good work And you can ask the people who can do all of that to just go home and pace through the rooms of a flat Feeling she's travelled right back to the start Stuck at home with her mother Feeling useless and smothering the light That kept out the dark I hate that he just sees me as some silly little woman That might be exactly what we need What? The mission might be in danger There's something strange going on between Montague and his brother what? Surely he wouldn't... But until he drops his guard and starts talking, we can't know. But he won't talk to me. He hates me. I'm the last person he'd talk to. You can do this, Jean. And we need you to. Even if dear Winston never finds out about it. So you're saying... No medals? No medals. No statues, no plaques, no flowers for Hester and Jean... I don't think that it's people like you or me That the crowds come to see And if there's one thing I know It's that I'm no good with things that need help to grow I'm afraid I disagree You've done a pretty good job with me Thank you Thank you I think that when people meet in the middle of a war It feels like it means something more So who needs a medal? It's this that we'll keep fighting for That we'll keep fighting for And yes, it was true say it's all they true. never believe they'll it never We believe did it. all we, we could do And they'll never see it never We see worked it. and we paid And, we'll and we'll it keep wasn't in vain going. We knew pain Even could be strength And that strength we could be pain We forced all our forces to fly We banished the pain Miss Leslie.